how credit unions can win the Gen Y market. It's a really exciting topic, sort of combining three different issues that are really top of mind for us at CFSI and in the broader landscape of the world in which we work. Um, so we'll be talking about financial health, and that is consumers' ability to manage their day-to-day -day finances, to build resilience, and to create opportunities to pursue their dreams. But that picture of financial health is big, uh, and it includes lots of different entities. One of the most promising instead of institutions to help consumers with their financial health has been for a long time, and we believe will continue to be the credit unions. So we'll be particularly focusing on the role of credit unions in the marketplace, and then narrowing their focus to one of the most exciting consumer segments that I think is on everyone's mind, which are the millennials or the Gen Y market. We have two fantastic experts joining us today to talk about the intersection of these three issues. On the next slide, you'll see our guests, um, and we have two really incredible speakers. If we can advance to the next slide, thank you. Uh, so on the left is my silly photo, but in the middle we have Tansley Stearns, and she is a Chief Impact Officer for Filene Research Institute, Filene Research Institute, which is really the premier think tank on credit unions in the country and figuring out how they can improve their offerings to help consumers with financial health. Uh, Tansley is herself based in Madison, and um, she is, amongst many other things, a, ru a runner, a mom, and a vegetarian, but really here an expert on the issues that we're talking about. Tansley, thank you so much for joining us, and if you're interested, if you want to say another uh, sentence or two about your background and how it's relevant to this topic. Well, I just want to thank you so much for having me today. It's an honor to be able to speak with credit unions about this very important topic. You know, my passion and background, I've dedicated my career to credit unions, and I do think that getting it right with millennials is critically important to our future, so excited to share our ideas about how we do that well. Thank you. Wonderful. Uh, and then our second panelist will be Ron Shevlin. He is the Director of Research at Cornerstone Advisors, uh, really an expert in credit union work uh, and a longtime thought leader and researcher on these topics. Uh, he's been a speaker at several CFSI panels and forums in the past uh, and recently uh, worked on a paper that we uh, partnered with him on, on this very topic, which he'll be sharing here today. Uh, Ron is based in the Boston area, and he proclaims to be the world's greatest basement guitarist that you've never heard of. Uh, I may ask him to play a few licks for us later in the webinar, uh, but for now, I'll pass it on to Ron to see if he has anything he wants to add. Yeah, thanks, Rob. Uh, we'll not be taking you up on that offer. Uh, to <laughs> and these here, and I just want to say that I am uh, really honored and privileged to to be taking part of this today. Listen, there's a lot of talk in the financial services world about disruptors and so forth. And if you ask me, I'll tell you that I think the real potential disruptors in financial services are the credit unions. I think nobody is better positioned to truly disrupt the market and the industry as credit unions are. We'll talk a little bit about that today, but that's uh, just a little bit of perspective I wanted to, to leave. Fantastic. Thanks so much, Ron. Thanks so much, Tansley. Really glad to have you here. Excited to moderate this panel. Uh, and my role at CFSI is, is leading the financial health initiative. So as all of this works relates to consumers' financial health, I might be chiming in and asking some questions to our panelists to think about the connections between these different interesting areas. So if we go to the next slide, uh, we're going to uh, attend a technical uh, accomplishment of passing over the controls to Tansley. Um, this doesn't always work. So for everyone on the panel, excuse me, for everyone on the webinar, if this doesn't work, bear with us just a second as we um, get this to do it. We unfortunately have to test this live. Um, so we're passing it over to Tansley. Tansley, are you able to control the slides? I am you give fine. us a test and see, see, if, yeah, you can see if you can advance right the slide. Now. Yep, you got it. Let's see. You know, hey, everyone on the call, bear with us one more second. There we go. All oh. right, so it's working. So okay, yeah, we did it. We did it. You know what? What I would say is, I think every credit union executive that I talk to, and we see this even in the research that we do with our members. It's always about this idea that Gen Y is keeping us up at night. How do we attract them? How do we retain them? Both as members, as employees, and even on our boards. And so when we think about Gen Y, who in the world are they? Well, they are young, they're educated, they're diverse, they are optimistic. What distinguishes them is this self-confidence, a real need and desire for flexibility. And for those of you that have Gen Yers on your staff, I'm sure that you hear about those needs. They are thrifty. They believe that government should do more to solve their problems, and part of that is because they've experienced 
this deep financial crisis at a young age and a weak job market and many of them entered the job market during the recession. So that's all played into who they are, their experiences, and their expectations within financial services. So because this topic is keeping credit unions up at night, it keeps us up at night at Feline. And we've done a lot of research on who Gen Y is, what their demands are, what it's going to take to further engage with them. And the most recent research that we've done, hot off the presses, was fascinating. We did this research in coordination with one of our researchers, Anna Maria Lasardi, and we wanted to take a look at financial capability. Looks like I might be freezing there a little bit. Let's see if maybe we could go to the next slide. And what we found is this idea that Gen Yers are both overconfident and underinformed. And that might be a little bit of a dangerous place to be. What we did with Anna Maria Lasardi is we went out and we asked Gen Yers, you know, how do you feel about your financial capability managing day-to-day -day finances? 74% of them said, I'm good at dealing with day-to-day -day financial matters. 70% rated themselves as having high financial knowledge. Well, that's great. Then when we went out and said, okay, let's actually test that. We gave them a small test. 8% of them answered all the questions accurately. And the first three questions I want to tell you were give me. So you've got this generation that's overconfident and underinformed about their finances. But what does their financial picture really look like? Well, they've got these major sources of long-term debt, not surprisingly student loans, mortgages, and auto loans. And 66% have at least one of those sources, and 30% have more than one source of long-term debt. Four in 10 have student loans. And from a short-term obligation standpoint, 68% have one credit card, and 52% are carrying balances. This is what really scares me. 52% of millennials who have used a pawn shop or payday loan in the last five years have used them three or more times. So folks, when they go to alternative financial services, they go back and they are repeat customers. So what can we do? What were some of the recommendations in this research? Well, first of all, debt management programs can help Gen Yers improve their personal financial management skills. So we have to give them those tools. But improving financial literacy can't be the old school seminars. Gen Yers are not going to spend an hour of their evening coming and sitting in one of our branches and listening to an expert talk to them. It's not going to happen. So we have to make it more engaging, more digital, more fun. And we need to offer products that specifically cater to their education and income levels. Essentially, it's got to be more meaningful to this generation. It's got to tie specifically to their needs. So we love research here at Feline. We're nerds. We geek out on it. But we know that research can't transform an industry. And so we've got to make that research move into action. And here at Celine, one of the ways that we do that is through our impact programs. So we did a pilot called It's a Money Thing. It's a Money Thing is a really simple idea. It's essentially a packet of content that a credit union can leverage to better connect with Gen Y. You see some examples of what it looks like. It includes several different pieces. It includes videos, infographics, social media content that the credit unions can share, presentations handouts, and we wanted to see, could credit unions take this content that's high quality, we collaborated with Currency Marketing, and so if, for those of you that know Currency Marketing, you know that their material is very high quality, could this content really work to help credit unions move the needle, not just talk about attracting and retaining Gen Y, but actually do it? So here's what we found in the pilot. We had more than 60 credit unions that are now engaged across North America and using It's a Money Thing. During the pilot, there were 20 participants, and 10 of those provided data. And you see the names of those organizations and their asset sizes. And part of what I love about this pilot is that we had everything from small organizations to multi-billion dollar organizations participating. Now here's what we found. We found that we were able to see credit unions increase the number of Gen Yers, those under 35, through this pilot. So that's fantastic results. We weren't entirely sure through a pilot that you would see that the 
the Gen Yers increase in membership, and we did see that. We also absolutely saw that credit unions were more happy with engagement via social media using It's a Money Thing. So you're seeing engagement improve, you're seeing new members that are under 35 improve. That feels really, really good. We also, it's interesting, when we launched this pilot, I'll tell you my voicemail filled up from credit union CEOs saying to me, Tansley, really? You're asking us as credit unions to show videos, and, and honestly, these videos are cartoons. You think that we want to show our members cartoons? That's crazy. We're not going to do that. And so we wanted to better understand that as well. Would playful, fun, engaging content really work? And what would the response be from Gen Wires? And overwhelmingly, the response was very, very positive. People said, yeah, this is the kind of thing that I want to see from my financial institution. Gosh, I wish I were getting this even in school. So that kind of playful content absolutely does work. Here's some more reaction from those in the pilot. Would you like to watch more videos like these? Overwhelmingly, 82% said yes. Would you recommend this content to your friends? Absolutely they would. And are these appropriate for juniors and seniors in high school? So the range of this content really working for Gen Wires is pretty broad. So what are the implications of this? So there are several. The first is that playful fun, what we call edu Educate education, you know, where you're entertaining and you're also educating absolutely does work. Also, it can attract new gen wires. We saw that in the results. We saw credit unions attracting more folks under 35 through this pilot process. One of the interesting sidebar benefits was that we were able to train staff on financial literacy topics. So many credit unions have gen wires, especially on their front line, and what we found as a side benefit was that having this content was a great way to help train internal staff as well. Social media engagement was also a great benefit of using it to money thing. This is a wonderful way to improve that engagement. You know, a lot of credit unions, again, social media can feel scary. You can't completely control it. Having this kind of fresh content is a wonderful way to educate and engage through social media. So ultimately, that is what we found. So thrilled to be able to share those results and this opportunity, I think, to move the research into practical application for credit unions. All right, Tansley, hang on the line. I have a couple questions for you. Just going back to the to your previous last slide, um, to hang yeah. out there for a second. First of all, we are already getting a couple questions from attendees about these materials, and I believe both your materials primarily come from several different papers, as do Ron's, and all those are available on your websites. So we're going to try to send out links to either those materials and possibly these slides afterwards. So thank you all for your interest in this great content. Um, yep. Right, so Tansley, my, my, my first question for you, uh, seeing all this information about financial education, is um, I think back to a lot of the research that CFSI has done, really trying to shift the conversation from one of financial education, which can be focused on what people know, to the idea of financial capability, which is focused mm -hmm. on what people do. Um, so we see some really fantastic uh, statistics here about um, you know, the impact of this data, of this project on the credit unions themselves, on people watching the videos, and it is really exciting to know that a certain kind of content can be more palatable and exciting, particularly for millennials, but I frankly, I think for anyone. Um, yeah. But can you say a little bit about the actual impact on financial behaviors? Did we see not only that people learned more through, your, through this project, but that they actually started saving more or spending less or accessing better forms of credit than the alternative providers, as you mentioned earlier on in your slides? You know, we didn't, that wasn't something we explored in this pilot, but I do think as we continue to do research, that's the important next set of questions. And, you know, what we found is that credit unions that started with It's a Money Thing are renewing and are continually using this to engage. And so I think in the long term, being able to study that will be important because you're absolutely right. It, you know, education only takes us so, so far. I always use that Weight Watchers analogy, right? None of us are confused mm -hmm. about what it takes to lose weight. We put less in our mouth and we exercise more, but that doesn't mean that we don't have an obesity epidemic in this country. And the same is true for, for financial literacy. I often use my husband as an example. You know, he's a brilliant person. He's an architect. He's probably twice as smart as I am. But 
he often asks me questions that I think are very common amongst just the general population that don't live and breathe financial services every day. And so we have to move, again, that education into action. You're absolutely right. Great. Um, all right, I have one other, one other question. Well, I have lots of questions, but um, first I'll remind all the uh, attendees to the webinar that if you have a question, you are on mute, so if you have a question, just enter it in the little question box, um, which is uh, on the control panel in the GoToWebinar control panel, and uh, it'll get passed along to me. We'll be able to ask it of our panelists, and we'll also have some more time at the end for questions. Um, so one thing I've been thinking about a lot, Tansley, when it comes to this generation is the changing nature of work, right? And particularly the gig economy and Uber and TaskRabbit and, and all these different kinds of work, and as well as just the, the challenges of unemployment uh, and the lack of you know, full-time, high-wage job. So what are the implications of, of the gig economy, income volatility, and these kinds of issues for Gen Y? Uh, and how can credit unions offer products and services to help millennials that are in these kinds of new roles? Yeah, so I think that there are a lot of different ways, and I think this idea, we think a lot at Feline about innovation, and innovation is a buzzword. I think most of us roll our eyes and we hear it today, but our perspective about innovation is that it starts with human-centered design, understanding what are the biggest problems that our members, our constituents have, and if we can understand those insights, those are where the best ideas come from. One of the things that we've been thinking deeply about is this idea of alternatives to payday loans. You know, you saw the statistics that can be somewhat startling, not only about the number of Gen Yers that are using payday lenders, but the fact that once they go once, they go back. And so I do think that, you know, part of what causes that, and you see this in the Financial Diaries work that I'm sure many folks have seen, is these spikes and these differences between income and expenses that happen, and then there's this immediate need to have sources to, to solve for that. And I think that credit unions can help with alternatives that will not be as punitive, that will hopefully also provide resources that get them out of those kinds of cycles. So, you know, I think that's one idea and one place that credit unions can go. But I invite credit unions to, to really think about that insight that you bring up and how do we use that as a source of innovation to build products and services that are going to meet these needs of, of evolving work that is very, very different than what we've seen in the past. Great. Yeah, and credit unions, I think, have long been leaders in in offering alternatives to payday loans with products that are more reasonably priced and have longer terms and you know hopefully more uh, affordable and successful for the borrower. So that's a, that's a great example. I know you guys have also done a lot of research there. Um, so just to, to clarify, um, Tansley was mentioning the U.S. Financial Diaries research, which is some really exciting work, really in-depth longitudinal work that CFSI has done in partnership with NYU. Uh, and I encourage everyone to check that out. And you just Google U.S. Financial Diaries, and you'll you'll see it. Um, and you also can see it off of our website. Um, the the one uh, sorry, um, one thing, Tansley. Can you just do me a favor? Could you just tell us what's your website and what's the easiest way for people to get access to some of this research if they really want to go deeper into it? Yeah, absolutely. So our website is Feline F I L. E N E dot O R G. Again, that's F I L E N E dot O R G. And our members have access to the to the research. If you're not a member of Feline, certainly email me. You can see uh, my email address. It's Hansley T A N S L E Y S at Feline F I L E N E dot O R G. And I'm happy to get you access to any of the reports that are interesting. So really appreciate the opportunity to engage. Great, thank you. Um, and Ron, before I pass the mic over to you, do you have any questions for Tansley? We'll offer a little crosstalk opportunity here. Yeah, actually, Tansley would love to ask you the it's a money thing um, concept. How, what form does that take? Is it um, are there um, mobile apps that um, that you've developed that uh, relate to the is a money thing concept? No, there's not a mobile app. So the content packets come in several different forms. So there's the video content, there's an infographic, there's a presentation, there's a handout, and there's an article. So every month they get those pieces. And there's also a social, a bit of social media content. So they get six of those pieces that are refreshed and new every month. And it's a subscription. So as long as they continue, they get a fresh packet every month. Great, okay, thanks. You got it. Great. All right, Tansley. So hang on the line. We're, we're going to come back to you, I'm sure, with more questions towards the end. I think she just painted a really interesting picture of this 
conundrum of overconfidence but lack of knowledge uh, for the Gen Y generation, um, as well as the um, you know some exciting results about some potential tools that credit unions can be offering to this population to help them improve their financial health. So it's really a great stage setting to then pass the mic over to Ron, who's done some really exciting research uh, along similar veins around financial health, credit unions, and Gen Y. So let's pass the mic over to him. Hopefully we'll also pass over the keyboard uh, and uh, this will work. And um, Ron, the floor is yours. Excellent. Thank you, Rob. Um, when I am ready to hit the slides, is there a button to hit or did I just click on this slide there? I need to see if it, see if it works, see if you can advance. Should be passed uh, over okay. to you now. Okay, yeah, there we go. Okay, All so right. uh, from go, go a credit union perspective, excellent, thank you, Rob. So from a credit union perspective, we've got a great overview of, of the millennial or Gen Y market. So from a credit union perspective, uh, what, what, what's the problem? What are the, perhaps maybe problems of tough work, but uh, maybe what are the challenges? And the way I see it based on a lot of the research that I've been doing over the past couple of years, Predominantly, I think that there are two challenges or problems that credit unions are facing in addressing the Gen Y or millennial market. And the first, of course, is an awareness issue. And in fact, to borrow some research done by Celine, they asked Gen Yers, why don't you use a credit union instead of a bank? And for those Gen Yers who are not credit union members, nearly half of them said that they don't know much about credit unions. So clearly there is an awareness problem. Uh, but what's also troubling is the second response. So one out of four of Gen Yers who aren't uh, working with a credit union said, why bother? And, and that's, that's an education and awareness problem as well. Because if you really did understand what the credit union difference is and understood how credit unions could help you manage your finances better than a bank, perhaps you wouldn't say, why bother? And maybe there's not much we can do about the one out of five who said inconvenient or banks are more, or the less than one out of ten who said banks are more sophisticated. But clearly there is a, an awareness problem with credit unions. Now maybe this goes away over time. When we look at uh, credit union membership by generation, it might surprise you to find out that the percentage of Gen Xers, Boomers, and Seniors who are credit union members is roughly equal. Uh, but those that percentage is uh, 10 to 15 percentage points higher than Gen Y, which implies that perhaps over time, these Gen Yers will become aware of credit unions and start to do business and become members of credit union. But the question and challenge from a credit union perspective is, do you really want to wait 10 to 15 years until these folks are in their 30s and 40s before uh, uh, getting them as members? So clearly, building more awareness is a, is a problem and challenge for many credit unions. The second big challenge, I think, that credit unions have relative to the Gen Y market is preference. A couple of years ago, I was working with ITA Group, and we did a survey on behalf of uh, uh, one of the, our clients. And one of the questions we asked was, if you were in the market for a new financial product, assuming similar rates, fees, and terms, which type of provider would you prefer? Uh, if you're the seniors who answered that question, about half said that they would prefer a credit union or community bank to a large bank. Among the Gen Xers and Boomers, it was a little less than half who said that they would prefer a credit union or a community bank. But among the Gen Yers who answered this question, a little over a third said that they would prefer a credit union or a community bank to a large bank, which was equal to the percentage who said that they would prefer a large bank. And as you can see, an incredibly larger percentage of Gen Yers said that they would prefer a large bank to uh, a smaller institution, more so than any of the other uh, generations. So clearly there is a preference issue here that, that needs to be addressed. Even beyond the awareness problem, there is a preference issue that goes back to that question about or that answer around inconvenience and sophistication, perhaps. But clearly there is an issue around preference. Now let's take this out of the, the, the theoretical in terms of if you were in the, pro, in the market for a new financial product, because what financial products are Gen Yers in the market for? And more and more, uh, they are in the market for credit cards. Uh, now maybe they're not this young, getting them this young, but clearly uh, Gen Yers are increasing their adoption of credit cards. And in fact, if we look at the younger generation, the younger Gen Y population over the past few years, among those that are 21 to 26, the percentage that had a credit card between 2008 and 2013 
uh, nearly doubled from about a third in 2008 to almost six out of 10 in 2013. So in that five-year period, Gen Yers were applying for credit cards and increasingly using them. Now, uh, this is news for a lot of folks because when you read the news, uh, all you tend to hear is a lot of speculation that Gen Yers are uh, don't like credit cards; they don't want to use them. But the adoption numbers really tell a very different story: that they're shifting their behavior, their payment behavior from debit cards to credit cards, and increasingly uh, using them. The challenge uh, for, for for many credit unions, though, in looking at this, is that credit uh, credit card adopt penetration from a credit union perspective is quite low. Drawing from some of the benchmark uh, work that Cornerstone Advisors have done, we have found that the median the median credit union has uh, put a credit card in the hands of only about one out of five of their members. At the 75th percentile, that's uh, just 30 percent. And this isn't even by age breakout. I don't have an age breakout for this, but I've got to believe that the penetration of credit cards among younger Gen Y members is even lower. And what this means at the end of it is that you're really kind of managing blind here because you don't really know from a credit union perspective that credit union members uh, are, especially among those among, uh, the Gen Yers, are actually more likely to have a credit card than non-members of the same age. Among Gen Yers between the ages of 21 and 27, 8 out of 10 who belong to a credit union have a credit card versus just 6 out of 10 Gen Yers of that age who aren't credit union members. And almost 9 out of 10 Gen Yers between the ages of 8, 28 and 36 where credit union members have a credit card which was only about 7 out of 10 uh, non-members of that same age. And because you have not put those credit cards in the hands of those members, you've got no insight into how they're spending their money, how they're using their cards, what payment mechanisms they use. And this is important because, according to the research that CFSI did recently, um, among credit union members themselves, and this is just credit union members now across the generation, among the Gen Yers, and we split this out between two sub-segments, 21 to 27 and 28 to 36, because we found very different attitudes and behaviors across the two sub-segments. But both of those sub-segments are as likely, if not more likely, to use their credit card often or always than, than older credit union members are. Uh, what's, what you also don't know, because you've not put those credit cards in the hands of your members, is how they're using them. and the fees that they're paying. Uh, and although it's not a majority of credit union members who are paying various credit card related fees, those that are are actually more likely to be credit union members than non-members. Uh, in the past 18 or months or so, credit card uh, credit union members between the ages of 21 to 27, almost one out of five said that they've occasionally paid a, a credit card fee because they forgot to pay the bill versus just 12% of non-members of the same age. And this pattern continues but in terms of fees, uh, being hit with fees in terms of uh, not having the money to pay on time and exceeding the, the credit line. Among the older segment of Gen Yers, uh, again, a higher percentage of the credit union members who paid a fee because they forgot to pay the bill, didn't have money on time, or uh, in particular, in this case, those that use the card for a cash advance. So it really begs the question here, so what? What does this really all mean from a credit union perspective as it relates to Gen Wires? And I think there's so what, at least one so what conclusion here is that payment card program design and payment experience is critical to winning the millennial market. Um, and, and so what I'd like to share with you are some recommendations for, for how to do this and how to start in looking at this um, based on some of the consulting experience that Cornerstone has had. One of the first steps that we recommend that credit unions take is to assess your competitive positioning. Uh, compare your credit union product feature by product feature against the major competitors in your market, both from a local financial institution perspective, but also, of course, from the big issuers. Because many of these Gen Yers are simply turning to the, to the large national issuers for their, for their credit cards. So benchmarking and assessing yourself against not just the local competition, but against the national competition, gives you a sense for, for how, how do you stand up? What are the, the features that, that you've got or, or perhaps will need 
based on what the, the competition is offering. Second thing that I'd recommend is to uh, click in here. There we go. To benchmark your current card performance. Many of the institutions that we work with look at uh, their card program from a feature and function perspective and believe that if they tweak a few things here and there that they'll start to see the applications roll in from, from Gen Wires and perhaps uh, you know, make an investment from a marketing perspective and generate some applications but really have no sense for um, what should the Im improvement performance be. It's great to say that you've you increased your applications by 5% over last quarter but, but how does that compare to, to the rest of the world? So we would, we would encourage you to benchmark your card performance in terms of penetration among you, uh, your members, uh, what's the percent of those that are actively using both debit and, and credit cards, uh, what the average spend is per ticket, your interchange uh, revenue, and balance per active account. So you have a, a general sense for benchmark as you improve your, your program over the next couple of years. And the third piece, and, and you know, as a, as a marketing guy, I'm actually very surprised to find credit unions that aren't doing this, but put together a, a marketing calendar that creates uh, a roadmap for, for the various uh, pro programs and initiatives, specifically around credit line increases, uh, biller direct uh, campaigns, back to school, tuition spending. Lay out your map over the next 24 months so you've got a sense for what type of programs and, and marketing campaigns are you going to run and when they should be run and what type of spending that uh, you're, you're going to be uh, investing in, in this program. And fourth, uh, and last as it relates to the credit card, uh, the card design uh, perspective, is to really benchmark and collect a, a solid set of information about the payments world and create a, a dashboard for both the credit and, and debit cards so that you're managing these numbers uh, over time. Uh, now, if I had a couple more hours, I, I could go into a couple of more of the initiatives. But what I'd encourage you to do is, if you haven't already, to, to download the paper that uh, Cornerstone and CFSI collaborated on, called Competing on Financial Health. There were four initiatives there. And I've only highlighted the, the first one here, creating a new payments experience. Uh, the, the second key initiative that we believe is critical for winning the market is providing life stage mobile apps, which is why I asked Hanley about the, the mobile app uh, for the It's a Money thing. Uh, third is deploying member referral programs. One of the, the key things we found in, in the research that CFSI did was that, uh, not surprisingly, younger consumers are a whole lot more likely to refer their financial institutions to their friends and family. So creating a referral program that helps to track and encourage that behavior is critical for winning the Gen Y market. And the fourth piece that, that's really very strategic and I believe potentially disruptive is to really change the name of the game in financial services completely and think about how to compete on financial health. Hansley spoke a lot about financial literacy and financial capabilities. If you think of literacy as knowledge and capability as action, and financial health is the end result. What is the result of this is, is financial health. And being able to measure financial health, either by the, through a single score or a set of scores, can help provide a roadmap for your members to understand how to translate their behavior into financial results. And much like we have a FICO score today that measures uh, finan uh, financial credit worthiness that has become the accepted uh, norm within the, the industry. What we don't have is an accepted norm for measuring financial health. And I believe that credit unions have a huge opportunity in front of them to create the standard for measuring and implementing financial health and changing the rules of competition in the industry away from competing on rates and fees or competing on vacuous notions of service that nobody really understands can measure and anybody can claim to have great service but to compete on something quantitative and hard like financial health, to be able to say that in the past year, we helped 50% of, of our members increase their financial health score by more than 100 points. And that would mean something to people because there would be a, a score that was uh, widely accepted and, and understood. So those are some thoughts. I appreciate this opportunity to share them with you. And uh, Rob, I'll turn it back over to you. 
Thanks, Ron. That's fantastic. Um, and I'll just follow up on what, what Ron was saying, that uh, CFSI, I mean, obviously, is very focused on financial health and really agrees with this concept that banks, credit unions, and many institutions can be competing on financial health. Uh, and in fact, very much aligned with what Ron was just suggesting, we are almost, we are in the process, in fact, nearly done of finishing up what we've determined are the eight key metrics of financial health. Uh, and we have our webinar that we'll be announcing those on April 14th. And uh, the research and data from that project will also be coming out in April. So I'm not going to go into too many details on those metrics yet because we're still finalizing them. Uh, and we'll have separate opportunities to really dive deep into what that what those look like and how um, how different institutions can implement them. The one thing that I'll say is that if this is something you are excited about for those credit unions or banks or other institutions on this call, uh, we are also launching a, a beta program where a select group of companies will be actually using our metrics and a financial health score that we've developed, one of many scores we hope that can be available on the, on the marketplace. Uh, and if you're interested in partnering with us in that process, uh, please reach out to me, um, rlevy at cfsinnovation.com, or you can just contact us through our website. Um, uh, Ron, uh, one question, uh, several questions people want to know, how can they get this information? So I see the bit.ly link here. Um, where else can they go to get this data from you? Uh, well, you can contact me directly at rshevlin, at, or better yet, give you my Gmail address, this business address is so hard, ron.shevlin at gmail.com, and, and I'd be happy to send you the, the report and any uh, supporting data, but the uh, paper is available on both the CFSI and Cornerstone Advisors website. Fantastic, thank you. All right, I have a bunch of questions. Um, all right, so I, first of all, I'll just go some questions directly for you, Ron. Uh, and I should also add to our audience members, uh, if you'd like to ask a question, please go to the questions tab in your control panel, and they will get filtered through to, to me, and I will pass them on to our panelists. So that's the web, the control panel, the questions tab. So um, Ron, so you talked a lot about credit cards um, in this uh, in your presentation. And I wonder if you could talk about, uh, well, so, and, you, and you were saying that you know Gen Y are not using credit cards at the same rate and not using them from, from credit unions at the same rate as other institutions. But the Gen Y is also coming out of the greatest recession you know, in 70 years, more than that, right? So um, and, and largely created by overuse of credit uh, and credit cards, a big piece of that. To what extent is this just a rejection of overconsumption um, and how does that factor into to this Gen Y uh, Gen Y's approach to credit cards? Well, I, I'm not sure that I think the hangover is over. Uh, you know, if you see the recent numbers, um, consumer household debt is back up as, as high as it's ever been. Uh, maybe not as high as it's ever been, but certainly uh, on on the rise, and it's and it's high. I think what's happened is, despite the either the health or not health of, of the economy. It's really a demographic shift. You know, we're talking about um, a, a Gen Y population whose oldest members are already 36, going to be 37 this this year. With less than five years, the oldest Gen Yers will be 40. You're talking about a large percentage of the Gen Y population who have sort of uh, gone past the, the trough of of the of the of the low point of the generation who are well-employed, making money, starting families, um, and, and needing and wanting credit, and wanting a, uh, wanting a payment mechanism that rewards them for their payments, even if they're not using that payment mechanism for, uh, for credit purposes. And in fact, in a lot of the research I've done over the past couple of years of looking at credit card use, it tends to be the younger consumer who uses a credit card and pays off that balance in full every month. Now, I don't dispute that that there are you know plenty of consumers with who are challenged to, to pay off their bills every month. But the reality is is that a very large percentage are are, are doing so um, have every uh, you know have no problems in doing it, but are looking for a payment mechanism that rewards them for their behavior uh, or a or a payment mechanism that helps them better manage their financial lives. And so to a large extent, what, what consumers want, or younger consumers in particular want, is kind of the best of both worlds. They want the best of the credit card experience and the best of the debit card experience. So they'd like some controls over spending. So unlike a credit card, which lets them rack up their debt very high, 
they do would like the controls that a debit card provides, but do, do want the ability to um, have a, a, a line of credit, have the ability to access rewards that a, a credit card can offer. And a credit card program that actively manages credit limits and increases that over time as payment behavior it, uh, demonstrates mm -hmm. that, that it's it, uh, worthy of that extra credit limit. But yet what we find is you know, few financial institutions, credit unions or banks, you know, are really looking closely at that, set that credit limit and, and let, let, wait for the consumer to determine when. So to a large extent, that this opportunity is there because consumers want the best of both worlds and because they are moving out of the out of the demographic band where you know in the mid 20s where you know worrying about what bar they're going to go to tonight and do they have beer money to the point where gee we got to start saving for kids colleges and we need a house and we need some cars and we need a minivan well maybe not a minivan but we need a new car and, and so the needs have been shifting as a result of this demographic shift and I think the other thing I would underscore here, Ron, quickly is that what's really, I think, at the, at the core of this is the death of the checking account. And it's not to say that there isn't an account that's needed to, to manage the money, but it, it isn't a checking account. It's a payment account. And having the ability, and having an account that, that provides this payment functionality that tracks the spending, that provides the feedback and input, that helps consumers make smarter decisions about how they're spending the money, things that a checking account simply does not do, it is the, 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 the key to transforming the game in banking. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you, and I appreciate that context. I, I, I might just differ a little bit of the way I would color it. I think we, uh, we've done some research looking at credit card users, particularly not specific to credit unions or banks or anything, but credit card, credit card users specifically as it relates to financial health um, from, our, from our same data set. And we found that roughly half of credit card users um, are considered financially unhealthy and are struggling with their finances in a, in a variety of ways. Um, and then if you look at former credit card users, it gets really bad, right? People that got really over indebted and got you know, charged off or, or, or closed the account for any number of reasons. So um, I think there are a num I think you're right that there are a lot of consumers whose you know, life is on track and have steady jobs and credit card is really a valuable vehicle for them and credit unions are a great place to get it. I think there's also still a large chunk of consumers maybe that are lower income or the folks that are over indebted with student loans as, as Tansley was talking about um, or struggling without full and full uh, full-time employment, for whom the credit card is not always the best vehicle, and checking accounts or prepaid cards, which are increasingly coming with many of the bells and whistles that you were just suggesting, can also be the right tool. That's just the context I wanted to give. Um, I want to ask one question for both the panelists, uh, which is, and I apologize, I should should have said this at the very beginning. We're talking about millennials or Gen Y, and I actually haven't asked you to define that. Um, and I'm going to ask that question in two ways. So, like, so first question is like, who, what, how are you defining this 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 demographic group? And then my second question, which is like, do you buy it? Um, there are some folks at CFSI who I would say do not actually believe millennials are a real consumer segment, and to suggest that people all lumped in together between the ages of 18 and 34, or whatever you're going to call it, um, to suggest that this is one generation with some kind of um, homogenous characteristics that can be marketed to as a generation simply because they're all on Facebook um, is actually, and many of them may be beyond Facebook now, right, is, is actually kind of an a, a inarticulate way of looking at the generation and that we need to go deeper and think about segments within that segment. So that's my question to both of you. I'll, I'll let Tansley answer that one first since she hasn't spoken in a little bit and then we'll pass it back to you, Ron. Yeah, absolutely. So, uh, you know, the age ranges vary depending on which source you look at, but generally speaking, Gen Yers are those that were born 77 to 94, and I remember that because I'm just shy of being a Gen Yer, so <laughs> I <laughs> fall into that Gen X category that got forgotten about. Um, and I think you make a really important point, and what's interesting to me oftentimes when I talk to credit unions, especially credit union boards, about attracting that next generation, and especially that first slide that I showed about you know what makes Gen Yers different, I think a very valid question that I'm often asked is, well, but weren't we all young once and didn't we all sort of have those inclinations? And, and it's certainly true, but 
I think a danger for us in credit unions is thinking that this relevance challenge isn't real. You know, I, I'm on an awful lot of airplanes, and inevitably my seatmate asks me what I do for a living, and really, no matter what generation, <laughs> they are more confused about the credit union part of my job than they are the think tank part of my job. And so I do think we have a significant relevance challenge, and you saw it in Ron's slides as well. Who cares, right? And, and you know, I think one of the things we need to be thinking deeply about is when you look at fintech spending, what's happening in Silicon Valley, the, the startups are really building products and services that are, in many cases, at the heart and soul of the things that, that we do or should do well. And so I do think we have to understand the needs of this generation start innovating around those really core needs so that we are relevant into the future because I do think that credit unions are well positioned because of our business model, because we're transparent, because we do right by people, to be someone that can make a true difference in people's lives and help them to be financially healthy. But they've got to, one, know who we are, and two, give a hoot who we are. <laughs> and so we've just got to do better at that overarchingly. Can you just say give a hoot? I don't know that I've ever heard I that. I give a hoot. I know, right? You can tell I'm a mom <laughs> of a five and a half year old. <laughs> <laughs> All right, I appreciate it. Uh, Ron, do you want to comment on this question or what Tansley just said? Yeah, sure. First, uh, uh, a quick comment though. I'm on a plane a lot as well, and my seatmates never talk to me. So that just goes to tell you the difference between <laughs> Nobody ever talks to me on a plane. You've got a better uh, poker face than I do or something. <laughs> I think there's just like this little label on my head that says, don't talk to me. Um, <laughs> so anyway, to your, to your question, Rob. Uh, first of all, in, in uh, collaborating with you guys in CFSI on the research that we published, we agreed that we would consider the 18 to 36-year-olds to be the Gen Y or the millennials. And we use those two terms interchangeably, although I think in the end uh, we use the term Gen Y throughout the report. Uh, we did, however, even more narrowly focus the research to the 21 to 36 year old group uh, because 18 to 21 year olds do tend to, uh, to be in school and not necessarily the, the real target market for a lot of uh, financial institutions. So we focused the research specifically on the 21 to 36 year olds. And you know you, you can you, you can redefine that segment if you want uh, you know a couple years older a couple years younger out of either range I don't really care there's no real hard and fast definitions of this mm -hmm. to the question and to the issues that your colleagues are posing about is this a segment well uh, you know look any segment any consumer segment that you define from a marketing perspective is never going to be a hundred percent homogenous. What you're looking for are predominant traits, whether they be attitudes, behaviors, or, or demographic characteristics that tend to characterize one group of consumers more than another. And uh, you know, I think there's plenty of statistics that help to support the notion that there are behavioral, attitudinal, and, and of course, demographic traits that distinguish millennials from other other generations. Um, one of the things, though, to support the notion that this is not homogenous is why we looked at the two subsegments of millennials, the 21 to 27 year olds and the 28 to 36, because of the life stage changes that tend to take place in, in one's late 20s and then early 30s. So we did find even greater differences uh, between the, the subsegments. Now, to the, to the naysayers uh, who think, you know, gee, we don't need to define this as a, as a segment to look at. They better not be the people who are saying that we need to market to women. Well, let's talk about a, a, a segment that, that isn't a real segment there. I mean, we're talking about more than half the population. So they've got no problem you know, talking about marketing to women as if that were a homogenous segment of consumers. So what you're looking for are, are traits and trends that tend to distinguish one group from another. And it's just the reality that there are differences. Now, of course, there are going to be Gen Xers. And there are going to be boomers who statistically look more like a, 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 a Gen Y or a millennial than they do the rest of the boomers. Somebody who's a heavy user of digital technologies probably has more behavioral traits that tend towards the Gen Y than someone else. It doesn't mean that they're not a boomer. It just means that they don't fit into the, the general trend of that population. 
the other thing that that I think you've got to we, we've got to kind of get past here is uh, you know, at this point in time, the, the number of people who are in the United States who are between the ages of 21 and 36 is such an incredibly huge number that we're not talking about an emerging generation anymore. We're talking about the predominant generation. And historically, it has been true that younger consumers represent a disproportionately high percentage of demand for financial products. So go back 30 years, and it was my it was my generation, the, the late boomers, who were accounting for the lion's share of credit card uh, applications, cre checking account openings, uh, mortgages, and, and car loans. And 30 years later, it's just the young generation, and they just happen to be Gen Yers. You can't ignore this anymore because they represent such a large percentage of demand for, for banking products. Well said. Thank you, Ron. Um, Oh, we actually have a question from the audience, and I'll un encourage anyone else who wants to ask a question to send it in through the webinar on the right side, to the webinar panel, uh, where it's the questions box. So the question is for Ron. Um, so with the loans to the Gen Y generation, there also comes collection issues. Can you expand more on Gen Y delinquency rates versus the rest of the market? Is there more risk involved? How is collection going? Well, I don't tend to think of collection issues or, or, or as an age issue as much as it is a, um, in, an income and cash flow issue. And just the reality of the situation is young, older consumers who have uh, a better credit history, a, a, a deeper pocket in terms of savings, higher income, are going to be able to better pay back their loans than, than consumers at, at the lower end of the market. So it, it's not an age issue that's driving. I mean, there's a high correlation between young age and lower income. That's traditionally and historically been true. The, the mm -hmm. issue from a financial institution perspective is simply around what credit plan uh, are you willing to, to lend in? And if, if you want to grow the business, can you go down uh, to, the, to a, a, a lower than what you've historically gone to? Uh, so the collection problem is, is not uh, particular to to the age group. It, it's a sign of uh, lower uh, of just lower income. Um, mm -hmm. But and, and Tansley, do you have any other thoughts on the question of sort of risk um, with this generation? Yeah, I don't think that I can add any more color than what Ron has. I I, I don't think it's necessarily generational. I think it is really to his point about the amount of risk that an organization is willing to take on. Yeah. So, yeah, I don't think I can well, more maybe, maybe I'll just pivot then to think about data, right? So with this generation, um, particularly in a post-Card Act world where they weren't getting uh, offers for credit cards uh, in college, I know I certainly got, you know, dozens of free T-shirts to sign up for various credit cards when I was in college, and that's really a thing of the past now. Um, means more people are graduating college without credit experience other than perhaps student loans. Um, does that change the kind of underwriting that credit unions need to do if they want to offer, uh, and data they need to look at if they want to offer credit in a risk managed way to this consumer? Ron. I do think, um, oh. I, if I might, I just would say, Go ahead. You know, another pilot that we're in the midst of right now is something called QCash, and it's really an alternative to payday loans taking a look exactly at what you're talking about without looking at credit score, what are those other ways that we might analyze the risk that we're taking? And so this pilot is all about, you know, the, the member can get from application to funding in 60 seconds with a mobile app, so it answers sort of that digital question. But also, you know, let's take credit score out of the mix and figure out what are those other ways that we might manage risk. So, We'll know a lot more about that in the coming year as we see that pilot mature and are able to analyze the data as credit unions participate. That's really exciting. Yeah, Please share that with us. Okay, go ahead, Ron. Yeah, I'll just jump in there. I, I, I you know, do see an emerging number of companies who are trying to offer um, alternative ways of scoring to get past the thin data file, the thin file problem. Uh, I think to you know what I have seen from financial institutions using them that they're really more still in the testing and experimentation phase. But you know, Rob, this goes to why you know I believe strongly in the financial health score concept. In that you know because that I would see that score is not simply 
you know, links to FICO, uh, nor would I see it as simply a reflection of income, but a reflection on behaviors uh, that can be tracked over time, that that would give a financial institution a richer set of data to draw on to make uh, credit underwriting decisions beyond just the, the FICO score. Mm. Fascinating. That said, I'm, uh, I'm not a big fan of these scores that uh, purport to use social media data. You're right, yeah, there was a big article in the Wall Street Journal just last week uh, about changes there. And what once was thought an opportunity to use social media data for underwriting, even by some of the um, most advanced startups, is now becoming quickly realized by many not to be at least the present way, that, or even the, in the immediate short term, a real opportunity. Um, had a question uh, for Tinsley, if you could elaborate more on QCash. Oh, sure, absolutely. So QCash is a pilot program that we're doing in collaboration with Washington State Employees Credit Union. So Washington State Employees has, over the last 10 years, been doing alternative payday lending, small dollar lending to their members. And of course, you know, 10 years ago, it was very much just the paper application, typical process in their LOS. But what they've built through their QSO now is this mobile application that truly does get the member from application to funding in 60 seconds, which, again, for me, one of my big concerns for credit unions is this idea of ease of use. So it really answers that question. And then the okay. underwriting, as I mentioned, is without FICO score, without you know looking at the credit file, looking at the other variables that, that lead us to understand the credit risk that we're taking. And so... We will be doing a pilot over the course of a year. We're inviting credit unions to participate. So, you know, definitely encourage folks that are interested in hearing more to reach out to me. I'd love to share a bit more about the pilot work to see what we learn. Great. All right, so for our final question, I'm going to come back to Ron's theme around competing around financial health, which is, relates also to the challenges of marketing for credit unions and competing generally with the many financial institutions that are, that are, that are out there and that millennials uh, are looking at. What does it mean to compete on financial health? How do you differentiate yourself as the best credit union for improving your financial health? Uh, and Ron, you, we have 30 seconds for you and 30 seconds for Tansley. Go ahead. Uh, so 30 seconds. I think you've got to start with the realization that not everybody, every consumer cares about their financial health score, but there are many who do and that number is increasing. Therefore, having a mechanism that says we're going to help you measure and manage your financial health, attract a certain segment of consumers. Uh, and so having that score and having tools to, to manage and track that um, becomes a differentiator in and of itself. Family, family? So the only other thing family? I would add is this. How do we, just like Weight Watchers, create those small moments of truth to celebrate people's success along the way. Because, you know, I, I hate to say this because I love what we do in credit unions, but for the average consumer, this stuff is boring. It's not fun. Spending less money and putting in a savings account isn't sexy. So how do we reward people at those moments in time where they've made a better decision so that we can create this this to be more engaging and fun, and that will lead to stronger financial health. But I think we've got to be more engaging about it. It's got to be something that's tangible that they can feel. Wonderful. Well, Ron and Tansley, thank you so much for joining us on this webinar. To all of our audience members, thank you for sticking with us through the hour, for sending in your questions. Um, please follow up directly with our panelists or with CFSI if you have more, and we'll try to send, up some, send out some follow-ups with links to the various pieces of research that you've heard today. Uh, on the last slide, you're going to see uh, some upcoming webinars that we've got for CFSI. Um, please continue to check us out. We have one on prepaid coming up on March 17th, and the one I mentioned on measuring financial health, getting really deep into these metrics that Ron has alluded to on April 14th, and I think that's going to be really exciting. So from all of us here at CFSI, and on behalf of our panelists, thank you so much, and have a great rest of your day.